Uh, I'm Bradley. I am the head of product for Surge, uh, and we just finished building Manifold. Uh, I have Jefferson here to talk uh, about that, and we're really excited to kind of like get into the weeds. So Jefferson, would you mind introducing yourself and go ahead and share your screen and we can talk about Manifold? Yeah, sounds good. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Jefferson. I'm an engineer at Surge. Been working here a few months. And yeah, uh, Manifold is the last thing that I've built here. And I'll go ahead and show that all to you. Uh, one second. There we go. Cool. Yeah, so uh, this is the Manifold UI. And uh, the rough idea behind it is that you can create a visualization of your text data. Um, so this could be um, supervised or unsupervised. If it's supervised, you can just have like a column with the labels in it. So one example that we actually showed on the site, if it'll let me click on this now. I can, oh my God. All right. <laughs> So one example that we actually highlighted on the site was uh, this uh, spam use case, right? And I think that this is like a really good example of one way to use the tool is that if you have the labels, this tool can be really useful for finding things that are potentially mislabeled. So for example, this like lone yellow point over here um, is being marked as spam, even though it's just a joke about divorce uh, and Barbies. Right, uh, and it, it's a lot easier to see this uh, once everything is like available in like the single view to you, as opposed to uh, trying to like scroll through a CSV and like right. just notice this out of the blue. Yeah. Right. So it's like a QA tool after you get a bunch of labeled data. In this case, this is just a public data set, but like after you get a bunch of labeled data, you could throw your labeled data into this uh, embeddings tool to see where there might be some like obvious outliers uh, in this like 2D projection of your language that might indicate that maybe we missed a label or in where in this case where it's an obvious like missed label, it also might be that we just like, there's a use case or uh, an edge case that our instructions don't like properly capture, right? Like we might find yeah. a bundle of labels that are sitting in a, place amid a sea of purple and realize that actually that those should be the other label it, and it's not actually a failure of the labelers it's actually a failure of our like instructions to actually capture this thing that we didn't actually really understand because it's not like we're typically going to be doing labeled data sets of 100 samples right we're typically doing thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands in which case like it's actually really hard to make sure that we can properly account for all of those edge cases in advance, right? And so this gives us yeah, some, like an interesting visual way to like quickly identify those areas where we might not have done so well. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's like a great call out. Um, I think that this like post label supervised way of examining like the actual labels that you got is probably the most useful uh, use case for the tool right now. Um, like you said, one for finding outliers, two for finding places where you might need uh, like better instructions. Um, another use case might be if like there's an area that's like very like, like, like this border here seems to be like, uh, you know, like a, a little confusing. Um, maybe that's like, uh, if, if you can notice patterns there, that might be a place to try and source more data uh, right. because it, it, it's going to, it's going to make your model better if right. If yeah, and maybe and maybe that's maybe that's it, right? Like maybe <clears throat> there's a, a place in your plot that there's an opportunity to actually go get more data so that you can have a more robust assessment of that thing, right? So that your predictions mm -hmm. can simply be better. Right? Like yeah. you're not gonna make better better predictions, like tuning your way to try to like edge out that like edge case, right? Like you're actually gonna need to go get some data to help you do a better job of actually understanding that edge case in a, in like a material way. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, what other, uh, data sets do you have on here? Um, um, so we can look at some of the ones that, uh, we've already uploaded. Um, so all of these are like the sort of like labeled use case that we were talking about. Um, I do think that another thing that is interesting that we want to explore more is that, uh, even before, 
you get the labels. You could upload the data here and see if like there are naturally occurring clusters. Uh, see if if within these clusters there are like certain predictive words, predictive phrases. Um, we definitely want to do more analysis there as well uh, and figure out just how useful, how much information we can give uh, before any of the labels come through at all. But uh, this is another example. Uh, it's created by this company called Jigsaw, which is like an, uh, I think a member of Alphabet that's really focused on uh, trying to reduce online to toxicity, misinformation, all of those like really hairy contextual language problems. Uh, and they have this data set that's uh, pulled from Wikipedia comments. Um, yeah, so this is this is one where uh, it gets put over in this area um, of mostly non-toxic, right? So it's, well, let's see what's actually going on with this one. Okay, it's, it's a little toxic. <laughs> uh, yeah. This is a tricky one though, right? Because- uh, Right, yeah. I mean, it's it's not like explicitly vulgar, but it isn't like kind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's really loaded at the the end here. Yeah, like all, all it's all in the the last two or so clauses. Yeah. Uh, so like, yeah, maybe that's like something that would be helpful to your model is to know that or to give more examples in this space over here. Yeah, this one I think actually is honestly just a mislabel. Mm -hmm. It says don't be a jerk. It's not that's not like a right. It's yeah. not being toxic. Yeah. But uh so this one's a mislabel. But I, I think uh one thing would be to, you know, like maybe maybe it's good to give your model more examples of using fairly normal language for like a few sentences and then having like these kind of like mean yeah. uh, sentences at the end, if this is the sort of uh material that you need to predict or to detect. And can you talk a little bit about the like the what's the tech? underlying a lot of what we're doing here. Uh, can you talk a bit about like how we're actually uh, showing these embeddings and, and kind of what's going on there behind the yeah, scenes? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, so at the heart of it is this idea of a uh, document or a sentence embedding. Uh, so the idea behind this is that basically for any machine learning model, you're going to want a vector of numbers to operate on both as your input and output um like this is just like kind of like the the bread and butter representation for uh machine learning problems uh the issue is like if you have like a sentence it's like not entirely clear how that should be represented as numbers um there's like a few different models for thinking about this like the classic one is um like yeah, like the classic standard one you learn like first in school is like just bag of words where it's just like each uh so you could do like a one-hot encoding where like you just have like a vector of zeros and then if like the word is in the sentence it turns into a one um yeah and then like uh you have like slightly upgraded versions like tfidf which is like the frequency of the term within the sentence divided by the frequency of the term across like all documents. But uh, anyways, um, all of these, like they fail to capture, like they fail to capture like context. They fail to capture like the usage of the word within uh, like the larger text. Um, and that's sometimes some of the most important information for a representation. Uh, so there's this new, there are new models, uh, transformers, which handle this problem a lot better. And particularly, uh, there's this type of model called BERT and this model that was, uh, or this type of architecture called SBERT, uh, sentence BERT, which was built on this transformer architecture. Um, and it's great for just giving it a sentence and then getting out a vector, getting out numbers that are like somewhat meaningful. Um, so sentences that are similar to each other will have vectors with uh, similar, like they'll have a uh, high cosine similarity is the usual metric that you use to talk about this. Um, yeah, so uh, we used Esper to generate these massive, well, not massive, but like 768 dimensional vectors for each sentence. And then the only problem left is to try and actually get them visualized uh, because 
you and I can't uh, think about uh, 768 dimensional vectors in space. Like it just doesn't make sense to us. Uh, so you need to project down to two dimensions to get the visualization. And there's a set of algorithms for that. Uh, the one that Manifold is using right now is PCA, uh, but there's, which has its advantages and disadvantages, but um, we found that it's worked pretty well. Uh, we also tried TSNE, uh, which gave, I think, slightly prettier graphs, but uh, didn't get as much separation, didn't get as much, it, it felt like some sort of information was being not captured by those graphs. So we stuck with PCA for the time being, but definitely something we want to explore more. That's cool. Uh, so this is Manifold, manifold.surgehq.ai is live right now.